A very good morning to you. Thank you so much for choosing Church of Uganda Family TV. And thank you so much for watching Good Morning Family. We're back from 7 a.m. up to now where we have issues at hand. Edwin Austin Mukalazi is my name sitting in now for Carol. And uh, I just remind you that Issues at Hand is proudly sponsored by Protea Hotel by Marriott. NTV. Now, Protea Hotel offers you the comfort at its best. All you need to do is to do your reservations on the numbers that pass uh, on the screen. Uh, today, we are looking at the national budget, the 2023-2024 financial year budget. We know that two weeks ago, uh, the Minister of Finance, Honorable Matia Kasaija, presented uh, the national budget that will take us through this financial year. Now, we know that it was supposed to effectively start its operation on the 1st of July, which was Saturday last week. And we now want to look at the implementation pinch because you realize that uh, very many stakeholders came out to give their views and their assumptions on the budget especially on some of the taxes that were that were introduced and some taxes that were revised but also you look realize that uh, there are a lot of things that really were not so clear in this budget now because we are already living in the financial year the 2023 2024 financial year we want to discuss this morning the pinch of the implementation of this budget and with us is uh, mr jeff wadlow who is an economist uh, from the civil society budget advocacy group mr jeff uh, you're most welcome on issues at hand kindly of greet our viewers uh, thank you edwin and uh, thank you for having me uh, on uh, family tv yeah. i'm happy to be here my name yeah. as you've heard jeff jidawi wadulo i uh, work with the civil society budget advocacy group as the program and policy advisor. Okay. CSBAG mainly uh, monitors the budget mm. to see that the ordinary citizen benefits mm. from it. Mm. And uh, this is what we really want and this is what we are looking up to. And on the extreme left is Mr. Stephen Sebugwao, who is the Deputy Chief Executive Officer uh, Kampala City Traders Association or the commonly known as CASITA. Mr. Sebugwao, you're most welcome on issues at hand. Thank you so much. Uh, first of all, I'm grateful to be invited here to speak to critical issues like the budget and how it affects the ordinary person. Mm -hmm. And uh, first of all, I want to say that uh, we appreciate the people who are tuning in to listen to this because we know it's quite important. Mm -hmm. We also salute the traders who help the commerce move in the city and also try to get uh, products to the end consumer and the end user so thank you so much mm. uh, so getting uh, now into the discussion this morning we know that uh, when the budget was presented uh, very many Ugandans were expecting at least hope especially in the reduction of the cost of living uh, which hope was a little disappointed I should say that uh, people didn't hear what they expected maybe uh, there was hope that when this budget is read at least there would be a reduction in uh, the costs of certain uh, stuff um, or commodities so that they can enjoy so that they can experience at least a revised cost of living which is not yet the case now um, mr jeff i'll start with you uh, what do you have to say about this and about um, the 52 and above trillions that were presented in this year's budget? Thank you, Edwin. Uh, actually, when, when you ask that first part of the question, mm. I was recently on some other talk show, mm. and one citizen asked that now that we have uh, a 52.7 trillion budget, mm. do we expect money in our pockets? <laughs> I, I had a very hard one for him mm. when citizens hear about a 52.7 trillion budget, yes. they imagine that that is money which is all coming into Uganda's pocket. Exactly. However, a budget is usually income and expenditure. Mm. 
Out of that 52.7 trillion budget, we have only about uh, 33 trillion, which is uh, expected to come, not even that the money is already in the bag. Mm. 29 trillion is anticipated to be collected by the Uganda Revenue Authority. And then another about 2.5 trillion will be from non-tax revenue services that government gives which we pay for like in tourism like in registration services and so on so and then of course the balance will be through borrowing both externally and internally mm -hmm. there is a slight change you would say in the cost of living for the better not necessarily that perhaps government has done so much. Mm -hmm. However, the global dynamics changing. Um, if you notice the price for fuel mm -hmm. has started moving down. You know how it shot almost about yes. 10,000 mm -hmm. a liter. The only two um, uh, big players, I think, who are uh, Total and Shell, are the ones who are still up at about 5,000. But the number of the other uh, petrol stations have gone down to about 4,600. Mm. So you can see that there is a change for the better because the cost of fuel, mm. the way it impacts on the cost of other things like food mm. and services mm. becomes a problem. So when there is a reduction in the cost of fuel, it has got a knock-on effect on other things. Mm. The price of food is still a little high. And that is a concern for Uganda because as, a bed, uh, as, as the bedrock or mm. you'd say the backbone of the economy, mm. we depend so much on our food. But our food, even when it is expensive for us as final people, it is still not getting much enough in terms of uh, in the pockets of the farmer. Mm. Mainly because the farmer is selling rural products. There's no much value addition. So the farm is not getting as much but also we still find the food a little more expensive than it is so if you ask me <coughs> this budget um, is reflecting about two or three things number one our budget has been growing for the last five years mm. remember at, at one point it was about 32 trillion yes now it is 52.7 trillion, almost mm. doubled mm. in the last about four or five years. Mm. However, if you look at the value of the money, the shilling has been gaining a little bit of weight on the account of some uh, increase in some exports. But still you see there's a lot that Uganda has to do. Uh, the the, the 10,000 shillings of today how much it can buy you in terms of a basket of goods. <laughs> it's not the same 10,000 that would buy you a basket of goods exactly. five years ago. Exactly. So our money overall has lost more value, mm. but is gaining against the dollar. I think it's about now 3,600. Okay. So a mixed bag, you could mm. say. Mm. Not so good to celebrate, mm. but there are uh, progressions made. Mm. I think also the tourism industry is rebounding after the COVID-19. Uh, incomes from tourism are rebounding and especially and majorly because of the increase of uh, domestic tourism. Mm. Now more Ugandans mm. are finding it uh, easier mm. to visit tourist destinations. Um, what else? Our debt is still choking. Exactly. 86.7 <laughs> mm. trillion. Mm. That is cause for worry. Because this year we have about six trillion Uganda shillings mm. in interest payments. Mm. Interest payments alone without talking about the principal. Now, when you, when you put that alongside spending for social sectors, mm. if you put it alongside human capital development, that is education, uh, health, uh, roads, and so on, in that hierarchy of uh, uh, priorities, it is actually number two. Wow, wow, wow. So, <laughs> so that means the more debt we accumulate, mm. the less money is taken away from these other 
very mm. critical. Uh, that's why you see doctors cannot be paid in time. Mm. Mm. Teachers are striking in order to be paid. Mm. And then, of course, the, the animal in the room, corruption. Oh, my God. Corruption is making the, the work of the URA so hard, the work of Ugandans. I know Ugandans who work so hard, if you, especially if you look at the night economy. Mm. Ugandans on the streets working so hard. But it is so disappointing that the money that URA collects and what the Ugandan money that the taxpayer is, is paying. Mm. When you hear it being hemorrhaged through corruption, mm. you feel so sorry. You've heard about the current conversation about the investigations going on with the Minister of Trade. <laughs> the the hundred million. Um, <laughs> so what is wrong with Uganda? The other day I was with the Honorable Mukhtali mm. in one talk show. And we said, I think Uganda needs a factory reset. You know, when, <laughs> when, when a phone starts misbehaving, <laughs> misbehaving <laughs> with, with the apps, <laughs> when the apps start misbehaving, <laughs> what do you do? You just you do a factory reset. Yeah. Uganda, I think, is due for a factory mm. reset. Because uh, how are we going to cure the, 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 the cancer of corruption? Mm. So, so it's like going to fetch water uh, from a river in a basket. The way we, uh, you, you have 29 trillion from mm. URA, mm. but about 10 to 15 trillion every year is lost mm. according to the IGG. Sure. What are we doing? And, as a, and <laughs> what are we doing as a country? Yeah, you realize that, um, like you said, that we need a factory reset. Factory now, reset. <laughs> Mr. Sebugwa, of recent, we've seen uh, Kasita having uh, a, a, a collide our collision with URA, especially with the taxes. And uh, Casita says some of these taxes are really unfair uh, uh, because you realize that the taxes are high and all you have to do is to increase some of these commodity prices in order to stay in business. Or else, if you to, 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 you're, you're, you're to cut the prices with the high, uh, high taxes, then you're no more in business. So what are some of these taxes that are pinching you so much as we look at the implementation of the 2023-2024 budget? Thank you, Edwin. Mm. I'll paint for you a picture to mm. start with, yeah. for you to clearly understand where your trader is coming from mm. on this. We have import duties of about 35%, right? Yeah. Now, the trader has borrowed money at maybe 30%, right? Mm. So just add up that and you see 35 plus 30, that is almost 65%. 65. Mm. That is what you're eating into the trader's profits, okay? Mm. But that's not only enough, but remember there is income tax somewhere in that mix. Mm. There is rent which has become a problem. Mm. So by the time you compound all that, the trader probably has about 10 or just at most 15 percent for what for take home mm. now remember he also has expenses at home okay mm. and he also has you know our ugandan economy there is always a relative and there is yeah. always an <laughs> uncle who knows there is a rich businessman <laughs> they are always supposed to give us school fees back in exactly. the village exactly so honestly how much is a trader remaining with when you compound all that We've seen some traders actually leave trade business and go into agriculture mm. because there are more concessions there. So just to paint for you that picture is enough for me to show you that the taxes are insane. Mm. It's just that simple. Okay. But not only that, mm. it also comes down to affect the final consumer because there are indirect taxes like VAT. Mm. And the VAT is always going to be what? Transferred to the, the final consumer. Mm. We all know that at this particular time, people have drained their savings. Mm. Literally, people who, I'm taught, who are seated on this desk, if I told them, how are your savings like right now? <laughs> you would be very surprised. They can exactly. tell me, but I know for a fact. Mm. So now, already the savings are drained. Mm. The same tax, I'm going to paint for you the ripple effect of this. The employer is paying payee, mm. right? Because payee has become too much and the business has slowed down, the only option the employer has is to reduce on the salaries, yeah. right? Yeah. But for you, your VAT is still there. Mm. So a trader to make money, 
he has to incorporate that char that charge into a good. Mm. But he's selling to people whose salaries have been reduced. Are you starting to see how this chain is starting to form? Mm. And that is why we are finding that the economy is struggling. Now, <clears throat> from the budget, they have uh, told us that there is this uh, parish development model which mm. is going to be putting some money into mm. people's pockets. When you do the calculations and you see how much it comes down to the final person if they were to distribute it evenly. That is a question I will not answer today, but between <laughs> me and you, <laughs> we know. So you get that. Yeah. So at the end of the day, mm. what for me I think is that mm. for government to be effective, mm. I will speak on a trader's part. Mm. They need to move with the trader on his journey and his goods and services. At every point, mm. they need to see how do they help. At the point of importation, what do we do? At the point of interest rate, what do we do? Mm. At the point of uh, the indirect, uh, the tax, the direct taxes like income tax, what do we do? Mm. And also the point of indirect taxes like VAT, what do we do? Mm. So that we're able to stimulate the economy. Now, you mentioned something about there have been some hurdles between mm. uh, URA and uh, the mm. traders. Yeah. And CASITA is an advocacy group, just mm. to be crystal clear. Mm. We do not enforce. We simply mm. come in when we feel that the trader is being marginalized or is being squeezed to the very end. In fact, most of these traders can actually solve some problems without coming to CASITA. But mm. by the time they come to CASITA, it means that all other avenues have done what? Have failed. failed. We are like a powerful godfather mm. who looks out for our children who are the traders. Mm. So, URA was closing the year. And of course they had targets. Uh, there, were, there were things in the papers that we achieved our target. Thank mm. you so much. Good for you. URA, you've performed. But the cost of you achieving that meant you had to squeeze some people to do what? To get the targets. Now I don't I can't say much for URA because they have a mandate to carry out. They have targets to meet, right? Yeah. But we also have to remember that the traders also are in that mix. So what happened is that uh, some traders who didn't have proper book records, they imposed what they call a presumptive tax. Now a presumptive tax is uh, when I come to your shop and I ask you, please show me the records. And you say, these are, these are the records. But because I cannot make much out of them, mm. I now have to look at your stock and assume that, you know what, based on the stock you have, I think this is what you should be what paying. But you haven't factored in things like, I've given credit to, to some suppliers. I don't have the invoices because some of our traders actually, they got into the business, but they never went to school. They have been doing business that I know mommy, ha, haji, so and so. He mm. will give me a, my, my goods, I will go sell, I bring back. I don't mm. need the paper because I've been doing this for the last 10 years, okay? Mm. Now that is something that you are a can't ascertain. You get that? So now you come and you say, ah, because we are seeing huge stock here, you must be paying this. Even the goods themselves that they probably have, have probably are also on credit. Mm. But because also we mentioned earlier on that the purchasing power has gone down because of various reasons that we mentioned earlier yes. on, okay? Yes. Low disposable income. Mm. So even the sales are not what they were. So if you come and you assume because two years ago uh, this shop was making 20 million, <laughs> and then again you come back, ah, you know, I think it is now making 23 or it's still making 20. So you see how you're going to squeeze the trader? Mm. You as you are a, a, you're basing on previous what? History. Mm. So I also have to, to, to kind of uh, feel for you because you don't have the records to do what, to look at what you need. Mm -hmm. But there are other dynamics you are not doing what, considering. And that is where you see nowadays, uh, if you've been on TV and some of the, the, the press conferences we've been having with yeah. URA, we've decided to team up with them and find a long-lasting solution. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> we don't think that putting groups every other day, close the shop, let us do this, let us do that. It's not effective. It disrupts business mm. and it makes everyone lose out. The trader is losing out because some of these guys, when they close a the shop, they can lose close to five or so million a day. That is the tax money's money going. That is the, 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 the lunch or the small kameza money that the man could leave for, for, for his wife and his family. So we've decided that, fine, 
where are the pain points? And the pain points are bookkeeping. You see, if we had better bookkeeping, and if mm. these traders were told this, most likely they might even be able to pay less taxes than what they are paying from the presumptive. Mm. So now, we need to go back and find what is the major cause. We look at it from a bigger, pers from a broader perspective, mm. and then we find a structured approach that is sustainable. And I'm happy to say that uh, despite all these huggles we've been having with URA, I feel like recently they have become a little bit more accommodative because they are willing to listen. Mm. Maybe that could also be part of the reason why they have achieved their what their targets they because they are now understanding that, okay, let's come on ground. Let's truly understand. Mm. What's the problem? I was surprised to find uh, that uh, URA, I was talking to some guys and they're like, guys, man, if the taxes are really heavy, you pay in installments. Mm. There was a time when they were like, if it is not zero, we are shutting this down, go pay, come back and we talk. But I'm surprised that they can come and say, let's let them pay in installments. Mm. If someone comes and says, the presumptive tax is really high, mm. this is what I'm really making. Mm. These guys are actually saying, okay, let us <coughs> rethink this and we see what we can be able to do with you. Okay. So we believe that uh, with some of these measures and more as we'll go along in the talk show, mm. that uh, perhaps we will find a lasting solution that will help us harmonize the 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 the, the, hug, the, the, the huggles and the struggles we've been having between the traders and ura maybe once and for all could okay. i chip in on that? yeah please do please do yeah thank you so much mm. uh, i just want to build on uh, his point mm. uh, actually the ura is struggling mm. we only have about three million direct taxpayers out of a population of 45 mm. to now 50, I think, if, mm. you, if you check our current, I think we've hit the 50 million mark. Ugandans are very good at uh, manufacturing <laughs> Ugandans at a very high rate. <coughs> Only three, to, maybe about 3.2 with the most recent efforts of trying to bring um, more taxpayers into the bracket. Mm. So that's a huge burden. Direct taxpayers, of course, you not calculate uh, the, 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 these other indirect taxes everyone pays. But the direct ones, both persons and companies, it's, it's less than 3.5 million. Mm. So that's a huge burden. So in our recent conversations with the URA, uh, just as we completed the National Budget Month soon uh, after the budget had yes. been read, we said broaden the tax base so that everyone pays their, uh, their fair share and then the burden of course the more you are the lighter the burden mm. so the idea of getting more people into the tax bracket means what getting records that he's talking about mm. but you see uh, until citizens appreciate mm. that we have got a constitutional obligation mm. paying tax is in article number 17 that's one of the uh, duties of a, a good yeah, citizen. citizen. You pay tax, but you're also supposed to fight corruption mm, and monitor uh, services of mm. government. So if you do those three things, you'll be a good citizen. But uh, I think there is a general apathy. The other day I saw one of the URA adverts. I think is this, this where this uh, businessman uh, is getting endeared to the URA. Mm -hmm. So he wakes up one morning and says, oh, I want, I'm going to visit the URA. Then his colleague says, the URA of all places, <laughs> is, is that a place to visit? That tells you the apathy mm -hmm. that citizens have towards the URA. But it's not a, a new story. I think you remember the story of the Zacchaeus, mm -hmm. uh, the tax collector, mm -hmm. when he was up in the tree. Already the people were like, I think you, you must not deal with the tax collector at <laughs> all. And they were wondering, they thought but that perhaps Jesus had brought a new way of actually avoiding the tax collector more. But when he, he told them that you have to pay to Caesar what is for Caesar mm. and to God what is God, it means that we have an obligation. There's no way a country can move mm. without taxes. But mm. our concern is the leakages in the taxes in terms of collection, but also in spending. Mm. If we could close the gaps, and I'm happy, I think uh, Commissioner Rojoki has, uh, I think in this year ending, they sent away about 70 staff of the URA. 
mm. in mm. corruption related. They are, they, are, they are now having cameras too. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> if we can close the gaps, every Ugandan should be happy to, to pay their fair, mm. fair share of the tax. Mm. For example, in uh, uh, last year he had the target of about 25 trillion. Mm. Now he has 29. Mm. That's, so the 4 trillion, you imagine if we're about 20 million Ugandans, mm. each paying their fair share. That would reduce it to about 200,000 per year, yeah. per Ugandan who is True. paying tax. True. But only 3 million, we can do so much. Mm. But the, the, the big challenge is that our, our demands are insatiable. Mm. We, we, we have a lot of unfunded priorities in key sectors like health, in education, in agriculture, but we can't fund them because the, we have a deficit budget. If we have to borrow, then even these uh, supplementary budgets that you see, that is uh, money that we don't have. That's money that we have to borrow. <laughs> wow, wow, wow. So we are taking a short commercial break. Mm -hmm. uh, when we come back, we are still continuing with the discussion. Please stay with us. Uh, thank you so much, uh, you who is watching Church of Uganda Family TV and issues at hand. We are looking at the 
budget implementation pinch. We know we are now living in the era of the 2023-2024 uh, national uh, financial year budget. And with us is uh, Mr. Jeff Wadulo from Civil Society Budget Advocacy Group and Mr. Sebugwao Stephen, who is from Casita. We are disseminating, uh, disseminating uh, some of the likely challenges ahead of Ugandans, especially as we go through this era of this budget. Now we are looking at um, some of the things that uh, were brought on board, uh, like the diapers, the tax was increased, uh, but this is something that, uh, you know, something that you would really think it was, it doesn't, it doesn't need to be uh, uh, the tax doesn't need to be increased. Why? Because the issue is given according to the argument. It was that let the prices be increased. Maybe it can be a way of fighting homosexuality. But we have adult diapers and we also have diapers for young people. So this tax is not discriminative as long as it is diapers. We also have uh, things like um, gaming activities. Uh, we also have fines of 100 million to manufacturers who alter digital stamps. We also have uh, uh, a 60 percent on spirits manufactured locally and uh, a number of taxes. So I'll start with uh, Mr. Sebugwao. You tell us, you who are in this business, uh, what are the likely challenges you're seeing in this Whenever you're making a tax, mm. you need to differentiate between essentials and non-essentials. Mm. You cannot increase taxes on an essential like a diaper. Did you ever do what they call an impact assessment to find out how is it going to affect the population in general? Remember, we are a young population. Literally, 70% of the people there have babies and they are producing left, right and center. Mm. So what is that really going to do for them? Are we saying that uh, now they are going to forego diapers and find another solution which again will increase the health costs? So we talked about a ripple effect mm. and I want people to understand this very well, the policy makers and even the tax people, mm. that it's a chain reaction. One small thing you do echoes throughout the entire chain. For you, you've increased the tax on a diaper, mm. but you have forgotten that because someone can no longer buy diapers, they are going to look to alternatives. These are alternatives that may give rushes to a kid because mm. they cannot afford the diapers. Mm. If they are girls, probably they are more susceptible to infections mm. than, 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 than boys because of the nature of their uh, uh, mm. The reproductive organs. reproductive organs down there because they are more exposed. Mm. So you've not considered all this. Furthermore, you've also not considered the bit of uh, environmental pollution. You get that? Mm. Because if now babies, uh, you know what they do, they, they, they excrete and mm. they do that. The diaper would have helped easily uh, dispose of that and keep it within the diaper. But now if they are going to be resorting to things like papers, what not, even polyphene bags mm. or what else, do you know what you're doing to the environment? So are you seeing how one small <coughs> thing is starting to cause a, and is echoing? It mm. is now looking into health. It is now looking into pollution. Believe me, if you go right now as we speak to places like Katwe, places like Boise, mm. and you look at what is causing the foul smell there, it will give you an idea of what an increase on a diaper is what is doing. Mm. Now, that is just on the humanitarian bit. Yeah. On the traders' bit, mm. we said this earlier on that every increase that you put on, that is an indirect tax that is going to be put on to the, the final, final consumer. consumer. It means that those who are able to afford will afford. Mm. And you see, these taxes, the rich people take it from me. They will feel the pinch, but not so much, because they have enough in their post to, mm. work, to absorb that. It is the poor people who will not do it, who will not be, who will be affected the most. Now, the big traders who are supplying to the hospitals, the likes, and uh, the, the, the other organizations, mm. probably their business will be affected slightly. 
but the person who is selling this at a shop in say Ch Chikubo or maybe Nabugabo or wherever is going to be affected highly because the average person comes to mm. that what trader Mm. So now you're going to be having issues of people failing to do rent, people failing to meet their tax obligations, mm. simply because one problem that reduced their 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 sales mm. has now what accumulated into having less revenue for you to remit for mm. your expenses and your taxes. Mm. So it is very important to always have an impact assessment when you're doing these things and there are advocacy groups like Casita, the mm. SESBAG. Why don't you why don't why don't the people come and consult? Who did they consult when they are talking about this diaper? They simply <laughs> came up with some ah, homosexuality. Mm. How ridiculous is that? Mm. Actually the, the the rationale I saw mm. in one of their books was that for the diapers that were being um, used that, that whose uh, tax was raised mm. were imported and that the material that is used is non-biodegradable that means if you used it and then dumped that diaper for wherever it could even take about a hundred years before it can uh, mm. be degradable so the argument was that they wanted to encourage domestic production and, and discourage the importation of, of finished diapers. And how however, feasible is this now? However, yes. Now, of course, uh, <laughs> mm. I agree with Stephen when he says, you mm. know, you need an assessment or mm. an incidence. Mm. When you are setting a, uh, a tax, mm. where is it likely to fall? Exactly. Who is likely to pay it? Mm. So that depends on the elasticity of demand for that particular product mm. and its use in society. Uh, but also, I think what uh, government does sometimes uh, when it brings some taxes, there are those that are called sin taxes, mm -hmm. those that are supposed to discourage consumption of particular uh, <laughs> goods and services. I don't see that well mainstreamed in this tax policy for this year. Mm -hmm. Then they also said uh, they are not bringing new taxes. But you see, what is new? New, <laughs> new is not necessarily type. Mm -hmm. New can be new rates. Mm -hmm. So when you say, uh, when you hear Minister Matia Kasaja say, I've not brought any new taxes. Mm -hmm. To the ordinary person, you know you could be happy and clap. But mm. if you have changed the rates yeah. for the current taxes, mm. that is new. Exactly. So what is new is not necessarily just the type, but also the rate. Wow. So we look at uh, some of the things that are being banned. One is uh, purchase of new cars and restrictions on traveling abroad. abroad. Will, uh, do you think, in, in, in a sense, this will help to reduce on the expenditure that the government makes that should and, and maybe save our 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 debt burden that should uh if you look at the component of what they call non-wage mm. as a component of our budget uh and then you also calculate wage which is about seven trillion shillings away from our national budget every year never mind that there are ghosts in there mm. and the auditor general is doing that job to clean the the, the wage, the, the, the payroll. Mm. That is together with wage and non-wage is about 85% of our budget. Mm. So if you have no travel abroad, only purchase of very essential vehicles, that's a good thing uh, in terms of what government wants to do. Mm. However, if you have cases of corruption in procurement, where you have about 70% of corruption actually mm. is in procurement, then um, you could be saying that they're doing, uh, they're paying Peter in order to pay Paul. If a lot of that money is saved, where is it taken? Mm. Yeah, because when you look at the approved budget estimates, a lot of money actually would, would be spent on travel. COVID-19, by the way, taught us a few things, but I don't know whether we have learned the story. When people couldn't travel abroad unconditionally, mm. yeah. However, uh, when now purpose, uh, government repurposes its spending and saying we are now cutting on unnecessary travel abroad, I don't, I don't know whether that also includes travel for for for, for treatment abroad, and who actually is traveling abroad. Mm. When they say they're not buying new cars 
I hope that, first of all, the current fleet of government vehicles, the Minister of Health is on record for having the biggest fleet. At one point, they even had about 4,000 cars. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if you went to their offices in, uh, in Mulago, you have this very big fleet of cars, but the rate at which they get spoiled, even a car which is still very okay, you find them parked, and I think sometimes they do it intentionally, mm -hmm. so that they can sell these cars to themselves. Mm -hmm. So you have a fleet of about 4,000 cars. You also have drivers mm -hmm. for those very cars. Now, if you are going to cut the cost of buying new cars, I hope that even the current maintenance costs, I think if you have ever looked at a bill of maintenance of a government <laughs> car, you could easily buy two more new cars. <laughs> Those things, I hope they can be managed, mm. so that uh, the money we save, if mm. I told you 85% of our, uh, our budget mm. in terms of um, non-wage, that would go down to about maybe 50 percent and then we can have more money in development development in terms of construction of infrastructure mm. schools hospitals roads it's just only about 15 percent i think this year it has now gone to about 30 percent of the budget mm. maybe then we'll have more money okay. going to infrastructure development okay mr sebuguao um we saw you as casita uh, holding a press conference and requesting for an extension of the deadline of the digital number plates and uh, we are grateful that this was this was hard and it was effected but what do you think was the challenge of rushing this whole um, uh, this whole uh, project of digital number plates Edwin you mentioned something about an impact assessment. Mm. We never did one for that, mm. for a start. Mm. But now I'll dive a little bit into more details. Mm. When this was brought on board, it's a noble cause because mm. for security purposes mm. and also for, for tracking purposes because of crime, mm. we all appreciate and we think it will be a good thing. Mm. But they never truly understood what would be the implication of rushing it to in order to put it in effect without having certain procedures and uh, methods in place to actualize. That's if you want me to say that. Mm -hmm. So one of the challenges was the fitness centers were not ready. ready. When they call a fitness center is uh, when you take your car mm -hmm. and you want to have uh, the number plate replaced, you take it into a fitness area, they mm -hmm. pluck off the first number plate, then they, pre they, what? they put on the number plate with the digital chip. Mm. So those were not in place. But you're telling us that you're giving us something about a year to make sure that all of these are actually done what? Are cleaned up in the system and everyone is driving with a digitalized number plate. So <coughs> there was no fitness center and that was an issue. So that's an issue speaking to capacity. They just couldn't execute. Number two, what were they going to do with the current people who are making number plates because they have actually invested a lot of money <coughs> okay and these are some of them are local manufacturers we are saying that the budget wants to encourage local content which we call uh, stimulating what domestic production mm. and in order to increase uh, the, the the earning capacities of the citizens right mm. and the contract had been awarded to a foreign firm only one firm like this to take monopoly of everything. So the other GM, Tumpekos, and the likes were out of that mix. So we asked ourselves that what happens to these people? That's a very key question. Mm -hmm. We further examined the number plate itself. For us, we thought that maybe it will be these fancy things we see in uh, science fiction movies or mm -hmm. having things displayed in numbers, wherever. Mm -hmm. But it turns out it's the same number plate. It's just a simple chip added onto that number plate. So it is not that fancy a technology that the local people cannot what, be customized to what, meet that demand. Mm. So we say that if it is the same thing but just adding a chip, can we empower the local people to also have what, the ability to do what, mm. to, to, to help in this matter? Because now you're increasing the capacity 
if you want a foreign firm that has this technology proprietor rights okay they can mm. so they can uh, they can franchise or they can bring in other people to help lighten the workload mm. well um so that is one of the other challenges that came in okay and then uh the other challenge we also had was that uh there was a clause in there that if you want to spray your car or it has got some damage mm. before you remove the number plate you have to speak to the chief licensing officer mm. do you know what that means that if you tamper with it without asking for permission from the chief licensing officer there was a fine and a hefty one at that so honestly how practical was that Mm -hmm. Are we going to say that because there are over a thousand incidents that require changing number plates <laughs> that they will have to look for the chief licensing officer? <laughs> are you saying that? Mm -hmm. Then the other issue we also had was the cost of this uh, number plate. Mm -hmm. It actually was about seven hundred and fifty, yeah. seven hundred and thirteen thousand, if memory serves mm -hmm. me right. That's almost three times what the average number plate of one fifty was. So when we looked at all these things, we realized that. An assessment was not done. Stakeholders were not uh, engaged in this process. But equally as important, even the sensitization wasn't there yet. Mm. So we felt that they wanted to run before walking. Mm. So we feel that they need to first learn how to walk then they can start running. Mm. So we say that perhaps we pilot it. Mm. We see how it works out. Mm. We learn. Then the positives that we've gotten from the piloting, we can now iterate and move to other mm. sectors, like maybe the, the warehouses, the, 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 the customs, where the cars stop from. Mm -hmm. So that is where the whole challenge came in. And I'm happy that they too saw the logic in what mm -hmm. we were saying. Mm and they decided to first put it on pause. Perhaps we can rethink the whole bit, this time involving stakeholders like Cassita, even CISPAG, even all advocacy groups, because okay. they all have a component and they have mm. something to bring to the table. Perhaps that would be able to harmonize this. Okay. Mr. Sevuguao, in less than a minute, what are your, part are your parting shots as per this discussion? As per this discussion, mm. I will reiterate the same thing let us learn to do impact assessments mm. before we take on certain policies, mm. before we introduce certain taxes. But equally as important, mm. Mm. I would say that uh, let us, let government cooperate with the private sector. Mm. Let it work with uh, uh, associations like CASITA, SISBAG, uh, USIA, and all others, because it's not just CASITA alone, mm. so that we are able to have a holistic approach to some of these simple challenges. We think that we can lighten the load for them. Mm. We also think that we can give some insights that the policymakers who do what they call a desktop analysis mm. are able to ground it to a live environment and actualize mm. based on real-time data and real-time uh problem solving solutions yeah. again uh thank you so much for having us here mm -hmm. i salute the traders and i also <laughs> salute everyone <laughs> else who has come in plus my brother here at this bag and Very you Edwin person. as well thank you so much uh, mr jeff in less than a minute what are your parting shots as per this discussion a very big one in the middle of everything is mindset change mm. mindset change by the way not just for citizens mm. but even for our policy planners mm. they need to to change the way they, they've been doing things mm. so that uh, we all do things that are, are of a common good to all Ugandans. Mm. The other one is for the URA, we need to work with them to widen the tax base mm. so that the burden is lighter for everyone. Mm. The other one, yes, we need to pay our taxes, but implement the constitutional mandate of also monitoring services and fighting mm. corruption. Thank you for having me. We are grateful. Uh, thank you so much for giving us this time this morning. And you, our viewer, we are grateful that you've been tuned in. Church of Uganda, Family TV. Adrian Austin Mukalazi is my name. Have a good day. We meet.